The following program is a Town of Colony television production of the William K. Sanford Town Library. I've never introduced someone who's both um, a nun and, I don't know what this group is, but maybe she can tell us, she's the president of the board of Clowns on Rounds. I'm not sure what that <laughs> group is, but... Uh, <laughs> so anyway, Sister Anne, in, in case you don't know it though, she um, lectures and does workshops on humor internationally, and, uh, but her day job is she works for the Diocese of Albany. She's the head of the counseling for laity, which does marriage counseling, individual counseling, group counseling, and all that, so that's her day job. But today she's here to talk about I Feel Bad About My Neck and Other Thoughts on Being a Woman by Nora Ephron. So here's Sister Ann. I was just uh, noticing all of the people in the audience that have turtlenecks on. <laughs> I, 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 I didn't know if you did that on purpose or you dressed for the occasion or it could be almost anything. I, I, uh, I really appreciate uh, being invited here, and, and for those of us who've read the book, uh, you know that it's, it's really quite a, a lovely little book that can bring some joy and humor. But let me make a couple comments first about the importance of keeping that joy and humor in our lives. You know, the truth is, that's how we keep ourselves balanced, huh? That's how we keep ourselves right centered so that we can really be able to take care of ourselves. Because we live in such a lonely, stressful world that what we're looking for are ways to be able to connect. And I think that as we find that gift of laughter, and, and laughter, it, you have to put it in your day. Please remember that. You have to put it in your day. It doesn't happen. It's like a vacation. If you don't plan it, it doesn't happen. So you really have to put it in your day, you know? Um, we, the Norman Cousins, let me just kind of put this in a focus for you. Norman Cousins taught us the importance of that. He was dying. And they said to him, you're not going to live more than three months. He said, then I'm checking out of this hospital. If I'm not going to live, what's the sense of staying around? So he checks out of the hospital, checks into a hotel room, and he starts thinking about his life. And he said, wow, all that stress and negativity caused me this illness. I better prescribe for myself some laughter. So he prescribes for himself four hours a day of laughter, and he rents movies. This is the days before the VCR and the DVD, so he rents those big, huge reels. huh? And he watched things like Marx Brothers and Candid Camera, and he turned it around for himself. He was diagnosed in 1966, and he died in 1990. Wow. Now, why? Because he put four hours a day of laughter in his day, which decreased his level of pain, which then allowed him to sleep. Do you see how our body functions as one? So we need to treat ourselves that way. You know, uh, so I know several people here, so you know this. I don't talk about anything I don't have credibility, and therefore I never address anything in relation to nutrition or exercise. <laughs> Because as, as you can tell, they don't fit within my repertoire, right? <laughs> but the one exercise I do believe in is laughter because your whole body gets involved when you laugh. Your body temperature goes up at least one degree. The glottis and the larynx begin to rock. It rumbles up along the windpipe, banging against the trachea, and it explodes out of your body at 70 miles an hour. That's what happens when you laugh. Stanford Medical Journal has a wonderful study that says 10 seconds of laughter is comparable to three minutes of rowing a boat. Now, why would you row a boat for three minutes? You see what I'm saying? <laughs> So I think what we need to do, I think what we need to do is to recognize the terribly, the, the wonderful gift that laughter is in our life. And then, let me just, before I talk a little bit about this book, give a homework assignment to all of you, because I think this is terribly important. We all need to keep ourselves healthy people. And so here's a wonderful homework assignment. All of us need a laughing buddy. We all need somebody that when the world's crazy, and they think we are too, you can pick up a phone, say everybody's crazy, but you and me, do you know what I'm saying? So here's your homework assignment. You have till 7 o'clock tonight to identify who your laughing buddy is, okay? Because we need that, okay? And, and then when you meet each other tomorrow, who's your laughing buddy? Who's your laughing buddy? And you can have more than one. You can have more than one, but you have to have at least one. So anybody here that needs to make a phone call, you have till 7 o'clock tonight, all right? And, and get that. So treat ourselves. And that's why there are books like I Feel Bad About My Neck, all right, kind of thing. Because these are the books that really, she does a wonderful job of just using everyday things to s help see the joy in the laughter that's right in front of us. She really does. And I believe that that's where, where laughter really is. That's where joy really is. 
You know, sometimes we look for big, huge things or we, 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 we miss a lot of stuff, huh? But you don't have to. You just kind of look around. She, she talks about so many wonderful, wonderful things. I, I mean, some of the stories in the book are wonderful. I love the story when she used to work for, Jay, uh, for John F. Kennedy and she claims that she's the only person that didn't have an affair with him. And, and, <laughs> and she's probably right, but, but you know, the other thing... The other thing is that what she does is she just uses her everyday examples. And that's what you have, too. You know, I think sometimes we think other people have that, but you have it, too. It exists in your life. There are things that really and truly, you know, you trip over it if you start to look for it, huh? We really do. And, and I think that what, what she does in this book is kind of bring us down to just look for the everyday things that, go, that do exist in your life, you know? She starts, she's got great things. I wrote down a bunch of things. I didn't want you to think I wasn't preparing for this, but I can't find the piece of paper that I wrote down. <laughs> so it's all right. So let me instead just say a couple of things here. There, let, me, let me talk about a couple of things that she writes. I, I, I think what's important about the book is, is to just pull out a couple pieces because I hope that you take the time to read it. It's not a long reading book and it's certainly not heavy. It's the kind of thing that we should really give to ourselves because it gives you a chance to breathe a little bit. It helps you see things in perspective. Because you know? it, it helps you see that, hey, there's hope. You know? There's ways that we can deal with things. Huh? We can be able to get through it. She, of course, talks about her neck. I mean, that's like one of the first chapters in the book since that's what's, what it's uh, entitled. And, of course, she talks about all kinds of necks. You know, there's chicken necks, there's turkey gobbler necks, there's elephant necks, there's necks with waddles and necks with creases and on the verge of becoming waddles, and she goes on, you know. And, and she talks, it's really wonderful. Our faces are lies and our necks are the truth, you know. <laughs> yeah, so we all ask for turtlenecks for Christmas, and that's really... <laughs> You know, that kind of, that kind of uh, rolls with it a little bit, you know, she, she really does. But it, it, she also uh, says that her dermatologist, now I don't know how documented any of this information is, but it's an interesting little theory anyway, the neck starts to go at 43. <laughs> so for most of us it's over and we have to just, you know, <laughs> enjoy what we have, huh? Enjoy what we have and start to really see what's going on. I think so often we wait for these magic moments, you know, and that's, I think, the gift of the book to say, wait, it's not. It's in these simple little things, you know. She talks about going out to lunch. Uh, sometimes I go out to lunch with my girlfriend. I got that far into the sentence and then caught myself. I suppose I mean women friends, right? We're no longer girls, and we've been not, we haven't been girls for 40 years. Anyway, sometimes we go out to lunch, and I look around the table and realize that we're all wearing turtleneck sweaters. Sometimes, instead, we're all wearing scarves, you know, like Catherine Hepburn on, on Old Golden Pond. Sometimes we're wearing mandarin collars, and we look like the white lady's version of Joy Luck Club, right? <laughs> it's sort of funny, and it's sort of sad, because we're not neurotic about our age. I mean, none of us lies about how old she is, for instance, and none of us dresses in a way that's inappropriate for our years. We all look good for our age except for our necks, you know, that kind of thing. And so she brings you back to that, you know, and she kind of takes a look at it. And, and, and I think, you know, you read the book and you find yourself smiling. That's, that's one of the joys of a book like this, you know, because what it does is harmless. I mean, it goes, yeah, me too, you know, kind of thing. Uh, she's about, uh, uh, about, I think she was going to turn 65 in the book, so that gives you a, a base age of where she, she claims that she is, you know. So uh, she, she uses all these kind of uh, interesting little things that really happen. She talks about looking in a mirror, and I think that this is really a cute little passage in this, okay? Assuming, of course, that you look in a mirror, and that's another thing about being a certain, certain age I've noticed. I try as much as possible not to look in a mirror. If I pass a mirror, I avert my eyes. I must really look into it. I begin squinting so that if anything bad is looking back at me, I'm already halfway to closing my eyes to ward off the sight, <laughs> you know? And she goes, and if the light is good, which I hope it's not, I often do what so many women my age do when stuck in front of the mirror. I gently pull the skin of my neck back and stare wistfully at the long, younger version of myself. All right? Here's something else I noticed, by the way. If you really want to get really, really depressed about your neck, sit in the back seat of a car. And I bet everybody here has done this, all right? Sit in the back seat of a car, right behind the driver, and look at yourself in a rear view mirror. Yeah. What is it about rear view mirrors? I have no idea, but there's no worse mirrors where necks are concerned. <laughs> and, 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 and again, what she does is say, look around, you know, see the things that are there. 
All of us are confronted so often throughout a day, talking to each other, listening to each other. We hear stories, you know, and those are the things that really we have to hold on to because that's where we find our balance, you know. Books like this, I, get, I think what Nora has done is, is just made every day into a, an adventure, you know, and I think we can do the same, huh? We can do the same because you and I are confronted with all kinds of things, all kinds of surprises, all kinds of things that exist in our life. You know, I've been blessed with many, many friends. One of my friends, Kath, is a wonderful, wonderful person, but Kath has never lasted more than two weeks doing anything in her whole life. She was going to go to yoga and lasted two weeks, you know. Then she thought that she might take up um, riding her bike, so she got her bike fixed up, and she even bought a new helmet, and that lasted two weeks. And then she decided that maybe she'd take up swimming, and that lasted two weeks. So we call her two-week Kath. As a matter of fact, the other day we were talking, and she says, you know, I think I'll go back to curves. Go for it, Kath. That should be good for two weeks. You know? and, and we make such fun of her. I have no idea why she shares all this stuff with us, all right? But Kath, one time, a couple years ago, did something that lasted more than two weeks. She decided what she was going to do was go to Weight Watchers. Now, she's not a heavy person, but she heard that you count up your points, and she was going to put her physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual life together using the Weight Watchers program, right? <laughs> go for it, Kat. That should be good for two weeks, right? And so anyway, we, uh, I was so supportive, though. She lasted 22 weeks in this program. She did. And we talk to each other probably every other day. We stop in each other's houses. We have dinner once a week. You know, I mean, we're really, really good friends. But Kath, I I'm telling you, I was so supportive during this time. How are you doing, Kath? What are you doing? Good for you. You know, really and truly, all right? Until 16 weeks into the program, all right? When she called me on a Saturday and said, come on in, let's go for a walk. Now, it was one of those weeks you couldn't put one more thing in your day. You know, I mean, it's like I was so tired. I said, Kath, I can't do it. I'm exhausted. You know what I'd love to do? I'd love to sit down, take out a book, and just read. Too bad about you. You're always telling everybody they should be connected to each other. You're always telling everybody they should get some exercise. You don't get any exercise at all. Now listen, we're going on the walk, and this is the route we're going to take. So she maps out the route and says, and just before we get to the end, there's a steward's. And, <laughs> and you can go in and get a small ice cream. Now, I know that's the carrot she's holding in front of my face, okay? I thought, what the heck? I could go for a walk with her. Now, you people who walk, let me just say something. Yeah, it's a cult. It really is, you know? <laughs> I mean, people have their own vocabulary. Did you ever notice? I mean, I wasn't walking brisk. I said, what's that mean? She couldn't tell me, but I wasn't doing it. And then, <laughs> apparently, apparently, you're supposed to shake your arms a certain way, you know, and I wasn't doing that right either. So she's yelling about that. And then I say something, and she starts laughing. She says, stop making me laugh. We can't. I'm thinking, what the heck? This isn't even fun, you know? I said, Kath, I don't want to even do this. Why are you laughing? You know, this isn't fun. We get to Stewart's, and we go in, and we get our small ice cream. Did you ever get a small ice cream? <laughs> They're like memories. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> You have it finished before you walk out the door. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Following Saturday, she calls me up and says, come on, Ian, we're going for our walk. I said, where did the words our walk come from, Kath? I don't think I ever put those words together. And she says, no, we're going for our walk, and we're going to do the same route, and we're going to stop at Stewart's, and you can get your small ice cream, and I'm coming over to pick you up. Goodbye. And she hangs up the phone. This time, it's a total disaster. Not only did I not walk brisk, not only did I not shake my arms appropriately, but I met loads of people I knew along the way, and I stopped to talk to them, right? <laughs> She's saying, you're not supposed to stop and talk to people. The rules of walking are you don't stop and How do I know the rules of walking? I don't walk. How are you supposed to know the rules if you don't do something? You know, kind of thing. She's yelling through this, all right? Then I say something. She's like, stop making me laugh again. I said, Kath, I'm never doing this again. I said, all you're doing is yelling. I said, this is no fun at all. I'm telling you right now, I'm never going to be home on Saturday for the rest of my life. Don't ever call me. I said, your friendship's much more important than this dumb walking, you know, kind of thing, all right? We almost get to Stewart's and we're going in. And I happen to look and there's a car parked in front of Stewart's. And there's a bumper sticker on the back of the car. And it said, fat people are harder to kidnap. <laughs> I said to her, look at that sign. I said, I'm going to take care of myself. I wouldn't have got the biggest ice cream cone I could get. That's what I think. Now, that's not a Nora story. That's the damn story. But I just want to say something. I believe that's what Nora does. She looks for the things that happen every day. And that's what makes the book so delightful, really, you know. It's not that you have to put something else in. It's just looking for it. She does a wonderful little thing on purses, all right. She rips off purses and pocketbooks until you're on the floor, all right. Now, I, could re I related to a part of it. I, I stopped carrying a purse so long ago because I always have a briefcase. And I can't remember two things. So it's easier just to keep one, you know. And, and so I stick my my wallet in my briefcase, you know, or I have a terrible habit of putting money in, in like a pocket, you know, and I think, oh, what the heck, I, if I need some money, I have something in my pocket. And then I forget to take it back out, and so, so I get some surprises sometimes, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and it's a wonderful thing. But she talks about purses until Honest to Peach are fallen on the floor. It, she's really, really, let me find the, the part I want to read to you because it's really good. 
Um, this is the one we polished over. Okay. This is for women whose purses are filled with Tic Tacs, solitary Advils, lipsticks without tops, chapsticks of unknown vintage, little bits of tobacco, even though there's been no smoking going on for at least 10 years, tampons that have come loose from their wrappings, English coins from a trip to London last October, boarding passes from the long forgotten airplane trips, hotel room keys from God knows what hotel, and leaky ballpoint pens, Kleenexes that it have either been or not been used, and there's no way to be sure one way or the other. <laughs> Scratched eyeglasses, old tea bags, several crumpled personal checks that have come loose from the checkbook and are covered with smudge marks, and an unprotected toothbrush that looks as if as, as has been used to polish silver. <laughs> Open up your purses. I bet your purses sound like that. We do. Did you ever notice that you decide you're going to clean them out? Look at all the junk we find in our purses. But again, you know, she just takes it and she simply points out the things that are there. She talks about, about uh, you know, uh, hair dye, you know, uh, and, and how, you know, she uses hair dye, which I thought was an, uh, another very um, uh, cute little part to the book. All through the book, she uses, I'm looking for the, the table of contents because I, if you listen to this table of contents, you know, I feel bad about my neck. Then she talks about purses and she talks about maintenance and being blind as a bat, you know, and parenting in three stages. And JFK, of course, she tells a nice story about that. And then she talks about Bill Clinton and, and uh, how she really fell in and out of love with Bill Clinton, which is a cute little story, too. I happen to do that saying so myself. What are you going to do? <laughs> All right, the story of my life in 3,000 words or less. And, and you know, she, she just goes through things. But I love this little section on hair dye, right? Many years ago, when Gloria Steinberg uh, turned 40, someone complimented her on how remarkably young she looked. And she replied, this is what 40 looks like. It's a great time. And I wish I had said it. it was, I'm sorry, it was a great line. And I wish I had said it. This is what 40 looks like led inevitably to the most significant corollary. 40 is the new 30, which led to many other corollaries. 50 is the new 40. 60 is the new 50. And even restaurants are the new theater. And she goes on. And, and you, you know, I, I loved, she would just take simple little things, and you heard, heard yourself feeling the same things. That's, I think, the gift of a book like this. You know, it, it's, it's down to earth. It's re really refreshing. It's very entertaining. It's, uh, it's got some simple little things that we look in a mirror and say, it happened to me too, you know? It happened to me too. And I think when she tells the stories, it always reminds us of other stories, which is another gift of humor. Because when someone can really touch a story that happened in their own life, it touches a story that happened in your life. And when someone shares a story with you, it, re it triggers off another story that, that you can tell. And as we really interact with each other, we build up that kind of relaxation with each other, which you know we don't do well. People don't know how to relax well. We multitask everything, huh? I mean, even some of you are sitting here right now saying, okay, as soon as she's finished, I have to stop over and get some milk because we don't have any milk. <laughs> Oh, I forgot it was Joe's birthday. We should have sent a card. And, oh, I didn't make that phone call this morning. I remember to do that. And we, you know, that's what we do, unfortunately. And so we miss some of the joy. We miss some of the obvious things that could bring a smile and some laughter to our faces. Huh? And so she uses those things to say, slow down, you know. Take notice of them. Just know that they're really there. I, I, I really do believe one of the things we can really always do with each other is to learn to slow down a little bit. To really and truly just decide that, you know, uh, we, can, we can enjoy the moment that's in front. The best story I have of relaxing is my sister. Some of you may know her, and she's really a wonderful person, but my sister, she could drive you crazy. If you, in, if she, if she, if you invite her over to her house, to your house, for dinner at 6 o'clock, she comes at 20 of 6. I said to her, they don't want you at 20 of 6. If they wanted you at 20 of 6, they would have invited you at 20 of 6. She says, well, you should always be early. I said, no, you should be on time. There's a difference between being on time and being early. So now what we do is we meet places, because she really does. You know, she's always got to be early. The Saturday before Labor Day every year, there's a group of us that go down to the tennis tournament down in Flushing. We're real tennis fans. Even if it rains, we go down, and, and we all talk tennis. It's our day. It's a holy day for us, and we <laughs> mark our books, and we go, okay? One year we're driving down, my sister's driving. We pass a sign that says, Tappan Zee Bridge, $3, three miles. My sister said, the bridge is coming. I said, yeah, I saw that. She says, well, I need the money. I said, yeah, I know. She said, well, give me the money. I said, you don't need the money now. You need the money in three miles. She says, well, I want the money. I said, what the heck do you want the money now for? If I give you the money, you're going to drop the money. My mother's in the back seat. She says, give me the money. I said, mom, she's got two and a half more miles to go. What the heck do you want the money for? My sister says, 
give me my wallet. I said, what do you want your wallet for? She says, I'll count out my own money. I said, I'm going to give you the money. I'm not going to let you get off the bridge without the money. I said, let me give you some change. She said, just don't you even think about it. I said, you know, peop- it doesn't say no change. It says $3. I said, I bet people pull up to those booths and say, excuse me, do you have any change? My sister reaches over, grabs the wallet, unzips the wallet, rips out three $1 bills, throws the wallet down. We get to the end of the bridge and we stop. There's five cars ahead of her. I say to her, can I point out something to you? <laughs> this is why I don't take your money out three miles down the road. Now you're sitting here, got five cars ahead of you. You don't have anything to do, you know? If you're waiting until you get here, you have something to do. You know what I'm saying? I think we don't know how to relax. We always are thinking ahead. We're living it. And so we miss the things in everyday life. The things that Nora really points out in her book, the things that happen in your life. There's nothing that happened in this book that hasn't happened in yours, really and truly. And what it does is gives us a few minutes to even be able to laugh at ourselves, which I think is another gift of humor. It helps us not to take ourselves so seriously, huh? Because we walk around, we've got the whole world on our shoulders, you know, we, we carry the burden of everything. We have to be so responsible, don't you know? And instead, you know, we can just relax a little bit, you know? And all of us have stories. And in those stories, as we share them, we open up doors to other people so that they can share their stories. And we do relax together. But we, I think if there's a message that she wants us to take from this book, it's don't take yourself so seriously. Just enjoy life, you know? Life's short enough. Don't take yourself so seriously. Let me tell you a personal story. I'm crazy about Johnny Mathis. Not a little bit crazy. I mean, really crazy, okay? <laughs> he could put his shoes under my bed anytime. You know? <laughs> now, let me tell you about Johnny, because I think this is what she's saying to us, all right? You know how Johnny came to the palace, all right? There were eight of us that were going to go see Johnny Mathis. I was elected to go get the tickets. By the time I got down there, all the orchestra seats were sold out, and the only seats that were left were upstairs, okay? Which, and everything was the same price. And if you've been to the palace since it's been done over, it's beautiful, and you can hear any place anyway. It didn't matter, right? We have eight tickets for Johnny Mathis. He's coming on a Saturday night, right? For Thursday, Mark Sullivan, the president of St. Rose, called me, and he had two seats in row B, Center seats. Now, if you go to the palace, it's double letters A to F, and then it's A, B. So about eight rows up, right in the center. And he says, Ian, I know you're crazy about Johnny Mathis. And he says, you know, you've sat on so many extra committees for us. He says, I really, I want you to take these tickets. I said, Mark, I'm already going. Give them to somebody else. I want you to have them. I said, I, I don't need them. Mar- I really do want you. Do you want me to get two more people? He said, yes. So I said, okay, so now there's 10 of us going to see Johnny Mathis, right? I'm leaving the building I work at. I work at the Pastoral Center in Albany here uh, on 40 North Main, where it's a building where all of the diocesan agencies are there. So everybody from the bishop down has an office there, okay? I'm walking out on Friday, and as I'm walking out, there's a person at the postage machine, and she stops and says, Ann, come here, i got something to tell you. Ginny, now Ginny is Howard Hubbard, the bishop's secretary. Ginny's brother's picking Johnny Mathis up at the airport at 530. <laughs> In the limo and taking him to the sentry house. I became an adolescent on the spot. <laughs> on the spot. I said, right, I'm going home. I'm charging out. I get, I get in the car. I'm going home. I get my camera. I'm going to go out and get a picture of Johnny Mathis, right? And so I go running home. I get it. Now, I'm only about seven miles from, from the sentry house, but you know what Route 9 is like <laughs> at 5.15 on Friday? Every state worker is on it, all right? And they're going. Now, I don't care uh, what religion anybody has. Don't think prayer doesn't work. <laughs> I got in the car and go, come on, God, I know we can make it. I know it. Don't turn that light. Don't get Keep that green. Keep that green. And I'm going like crazy, okay? I get there. I park the car. And I said, okay, act like you belong here, of course. Don't you know? And I'm sitting there maybe four or five minutes, and this big black limo comes whipping around the corner. And I said, all right, get out and walk like you, of course, belong, with your camera. And so I get out. And as I get out, I am as close to the car as I am to you. And out comes Johnny Mathis. And I go, Johnny Mathis. <laughs> he comes right over. He takes my hand. He is so soft. I'm telling you. <laughs> he is so, you melt. You melt right there, right? I say, Johnny, are you only going to sing to me tomorrow night? (laughs) He said, of course I am. (laughs) Now I don't care who's there. He's only going to do it for me. He just told me, right? I said, Johnny, are you going to sing my favorite song, What I Did, I Did for Love? And he goes, I don't know. I said, it's really all right. I said, Johnny, could we have a picture taken? He goes, of course we can. Rudy, come over here and take our picture. My Christmas card. (laughs) (laughs) Here's the end of the story. Saturday, we're going down to see Johnny, okay? There's 10 of us. 
we couldn't get reservations anyplace. Everything in the world was happening that Saturday down in Albany. So we decided we're going to get pizza and chicken wings and have them come to the house. Everybody come. And then we'll take two cars down to the city, which is much more sensible than taking 10 cars, as you know. And so we said, that's a good idea. So everybody comes to my house. We have pizza and chicken wings. We're starting to go out. And I said, wait a minute. Two people have to sit downstairs. And there's dead silence. No. <laughs> so I turned. I said, Mom, want to sit downstairs with me? And my mother, if you ever meet my mother, you'll know that this is true. My mother's the greatest person in the world. My mother quickly turned and said, why don't you let Janet sit downstairs with you? Janet is my friend who had been in Peru for 20 years. We just brought her home to bury her mother. And she had just been diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Right? And Janet quickly turned and said, that's so nice. And I thought, isn't that typical of my mother to be so selfless? And, and I thought, good, OK, so now we go. We're all taken off, right? We get in the cars. We go down to the to palace. Now, all of us know that Albany is the size of this room. All right? <laughs> everybody knows everybody, do you know? So we're walking in, everyone's like, hey, Ann, how are you doing? Ann, good to see you. Ann, what are you doing? And they're, okay, we're all gone. My friend turns, she says, you know everybody? I said, everybody knows everybody. This is Albany, this is Albany, you know, kind of thing. I couldn't live here. It's like I'd be in a bubble. I said, no, it's not. You get used to it. Come on, don't worry about it. Anyway, we sit down. As we sit down, Jerry Jennings and Betty Barnett come over. And, and I, I'm talking to them, and I said, he's only singing to me tonight anyway. He <laughs> says, how do you know? I tell him the story. You're stalking the guy? You're stalking the guy? <laughs> Now I'm thinking I'm going to get arrested, you know? I'm thinking, holy Christmas. I said, no, I don't think so. I thought, oh, okay, now he starts. He comes out, and he does his first half, all right? First half of the show. He, he is so wonderful. He just goes right into the next song. You know every word he's singing. He's just so absolute. Oh, your heart is right there. I'm telling you. Then there was a, he goes off. There's a, a comedian, and now there's an intermission. We go upstairs, but there were a lot of people sitting around us who told us that they had season passes, and they never stayed for the whole show of anything. They only stayed for the first half. So they said, tell your friends to come on back down here. And I'm thinking, why would you do that? I, you know? Anyway, so I go upstairs, and we say to them, come on downstairs. There's plenty of seats. You know, come on down. Oh, no, we love these seats up here. And they could. They could see wonderful. They were happy. All right. So we go back downstairs. As we get down there, the usher at the door says, Sister Ann, Sister Ann, hurry up. Come here, quick. They have seats. Everybody's looking for you. They have seats way up in front. Now we're in row BB, <laughs> and there are no seats in AA, and we can touch the stage. And out comes my Johnny in a black tux. I'm telling you the truth. If I didn't have vows, I would have given it all up right now. <laughs> he goes on, okay? He just goes right into the next song. All right? It's absolutely wonderful, all right? Now he's finished and he walks off. But as he walks off, he, he walks and never looks up. He walks off the stage. And what we can't see, but they can see upstairs, is that there are two lines on the stage, so you won't go too close to the edge, all right? Obviously used as a guide. He then turns around, he comes back out and does an encore. And then he starts to walk off again. I'm going to pretend you're me, okay? And as he walks off, he, again, he's not looking out at all. He just walks off, and all of a sudden he stops, and he sees me and stops and waves. Oh. Everybody went, everybody, he waved to Anne. <laughs> I said, I told you. He said, I'm walking out. He waved to you. I said, I know. I'm telling you. I got calls all week long. And he waved to you. I know. I'm telling you. This is my point. I think what Nora Ephraim does in this book is say, wait, there's all kinds of fun we can have. We still can be serious people. We still can be you know, very responsible people. But we can enjoy ourselves. And we grab those moments that are there. And we really and truly stop taking ourselves so seriously and find the joy that we can be able to laugh at. She does it using everything that happens in her day. She does, it's not, nothing unusual. There's nothing that she has to create. There's nothing she has to invent. She just brings to us the reality that the joy and the humor is really always right in front of us. And when we grab it, we bring to ourselves the gift. Huh? And then we can always share it with somebody else, which then keeps us connected to each other. I see I've gone over the time that Joe told me I should talk. So uh, let, let me just ask, I guess he said you can, we can ask some questions or talk together. So let's do that. What, what, what do you want to say or ask for? And I'm not the only person in this room. And I also know there's a bunch of people that have read the book. So we have all the resources in this room. And I didn't tell you the whole book because I want you to read it. It's good. It's really good. Yeah. The, the people who read it, did you enjoy it? Yeah, yeah. it is. It's, it's quite, it, and it's very light reading. You know, which she also wrote when Harry met Sally yeah. and yeah. Sleepless in Seattle. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, if you're romantic at heart, you're going to like her. Do you know what I'm saying? Because of the, but this is not the same kind. It doesn't have a plot like that. It's not a novel. It's, it's just stories of what happens in our day. Yes, please. Who are some of your other humorists? I know I love Loretta LaRoche, and maybe you have some other people to suggest that for humorists? 
Loretta's, Loretta's a friend of mine, and she, she's really very fine. Um, there, there are there are loads of good people in, in the, the humor world. Um, the, what? Janet Ivanovich. Yeah. Yeah, Janet Ivanovich is one. Um, of course, your mind goes blank when you ask those kinds of questions. <laughs> 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 well, uh, Patty Wooden, for anybody here who might be in hospital work or nursing homes or want to find some joy to bring to people in that area, Patty Wooden is somebody who's an expert in that area. Um, Alan Klein is probably one of the greatest people to show the importance of laughter and humor and based in a lot of based on theory. So it's it's not just, you know, you can also find some funny stories, which you can, you can be able to, Bernie Se Siegel does a good idea, a good uh, deal of humor, using a good deal of humor in dealing with cancer patients and, and people um, that are there. I speak with so many of them, I'm trying to see all the people I speak with on, 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 on all these places, but they're, they're really quite good. And some of them use references to each other in, in their books, and so that might be able to be a help. But those are a few good ones. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Don't, you know, don't waste your time reading stuff that you don't like. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, life's too short. Read stuff that you can enjoy and have a good time with and, you know, be able to. I, I was in, I gave a presentation on Friday up in um, uh, Toronto, so I took the book with me again just to read it one more time, you know, kind of thing. And I'm sitting in the Toronto airport, and this guy comes over and he says, you're enjoying it, aren't you? And I, and I wasn't paying any attention to him. And I said, it's really a delight. It's just got great stories. And he said, I'm watching a smile on your face. <laughs> he said, every so often you smile. And I think, I wonder what you just read. <laughs> and I think, you know, that's what we do. We, we can grab from it. Just like we sometimes grab from other things or other people, some stories you can grab from good books. Good books. Thank God we can read. Please. Two quick questions. Oh. Number one is you mentioned that your favorite song was What I Did for Love. Did he sing it to you? <laughs> no, 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 but he's going to come to my house someday. Right? <laughs> I believe that. I believe that. Someday the doorbell's going to ring and Johnny's going to ring. Now, the other question I have is we spoke many years ago and we, we uh, agreed that our favorite show absolutely of all time is A Chorus Love. That's right. Is it? And that's where the song, What I Did, I Did for Love, is from. Yes, it's from a chorus line, which is just in love in Albany, or in New York again. Yeah. It's, it's a, you know what I loved about a chorus line, if anyone ever uh, wanted to see a Broadway show? It's a story of a bunch of real people who stand up and tell us the struggle of how they're going to, how much they need this job. You know, and they're so honest with us, and they're you, you just know them, and I, you know, and it's it's a delightful story. And at the end of it, you want to say to them, well, it doesn't matter that you told us that; it's okay. You know, who cares? Because they shared so much of who they were with us that you really felt that intimate bond with every person on the stage. It's a great, great. Play. It's not filled with the stuff of Broadway. I don't know what the new one is like because I haven't seen it. But it, it doesn't have like wonderful scenery. It doesn't have great costumes. I mean, people just walk out there auditioning for a chorus line. It's an empty stage, and people are dungarees and sweatshirts, you know, kind of thing. And I think sometimes people get taken back at that and say, what's this all about? But there's a real message in that. It's a wonderful thing. I also think that's what humor lets us do with each other. I think it lets us risk just enjoying each other, not having to be perfect, not ever, you know, you know, not, not having to be anybody, just to be ourselves. It almost calls us back to walk on this holy ground and, and just enjoy life, you know? And, and so, of course, line does that for me too. What else, please? So. Yeah, my husband, John, loves to read history books and biographical books and books yeah. about presidents. And I like to read anything and, again, things that make me feel good. Yeah. So my daughter-in-law got me started on Janet Ivanovich's books. Yeah. And so I'd sit there at night and John said, you never see him smile when he's reading his books about wars. Yeah. And he watched me and I'm actually laughing out loud. So he said, let me have one of those. Good. Good. So I'm open. The guy is reading books now and he's laughing out loud. See? So the one day at the lunch table, he's eating chicken soup. All of a sudden, soup's coming out of his stomach. <laughs> yes, he's yeah. read every one of her books. Good. 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 Right down the whole line, right? Every one. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, and he looks, he looks 10 years younger afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a good thing. I want to bring you back to what Phil just said, because the truth is, it does keep us younger. It keeps us really more relaxed. It decreases the stress and anxiety for us. Helps us be able to really enjoy life a little bit. So, it, you know, there, there's something to that. It does keep us healthier people. Please, Russ. Don't be ashamed to ask a question. But if she ever mentioned that husband, 
or a child or a psychiatrist? <laughs> no. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Has she ever mentioned her husband, a child, or a psychiatrist? <laughs> <laughs> Help me, the other people who've read it. Yes, she, yes. she, she married three times. She was married three times. She had three children. And then she talks about her divorces. And her children. She had three children. She has three children, but she talks about, you know, uh, no, and this one wasn't the right one. <laughs> you know, and she goes on to the next one. So that's the way she talked about her husbands, not not talking about a relationship with them being healthy or anything. Thank you. <laughs> I think when she talked about the apartment that she loved, that she didn't want to leave, I think that's yeah. when she mentioned three children. That's right, that's right. And, and the house that she never bought, and she keeps going back to that. Sometimes she should pay attention to something she wanted to buy an apartment in New York City, which she would have made. And her friend talked her out of it. Yeah. And so she, she makes decisions now based on not letting her friend decide anymore for her <laughs> and what's going on. But that's kind of the way that she you know, you know, talks more about the, the, the history of her own life and how she kind of made it through that. Good stories, though, please. And I love your, I love your humor. I'm more like you and my sister. It's more like your sister. <laughs> she tries so hard to have me be perfect, and and I'm not. And now I'm glad I'm not. But I, I didn't read this book. I think if you were um, talking on the um, technology of physics, I would buy the book because whatever you talk about, you do it with <laughs> such enthusiasm. <laughs> and I have not read it. I just heard you were here. And, and I'm here because I think the outlook on life is laughter is so much so much fun and you, you portray that everywhere you speak and Thanks, I wasn't going to say you're not perfect but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I hate to break your bone but <laughs> I, I love this story about you on, on the plane with a wrestler the moment the guy walked in on you in the bathroom you just laughed at yourself <laughs> I would have taken my life <laughs> Not now, but that, those are funny stories, Dan, I think. But again, there's th and what we're also pointing out is there are everyday things. You know, if sitting next to somebody on an airplane or yeah. having somebody walk in on when you're going to the bathroom. It was a priest, by the way. <laughs> He's a stutter. <laughs> He's a stutter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all the time. No, no, I, he, I was sitting there going to the bathroom, the door opened, and he goes, D -d 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 Jesus Christ! <laughs> and I said, not quite, come in and get out. <laughs> but anyway, but you have to laugh. I mean, what's the sense? What's the sense of getting yourself all up tight? You know what I'm saying? His victory was about three weeks later when he came back and he said, you know, we have thanks, you didn't make fun of me, you didn't put me down, you didn't embarrass me. I said, what am I going to embarrass you for? I'm the one sitting there going to the <laughs> But just, you know, and I think we can. I don't think, I don't think we even have to always just depend on other people's books. I think we can look for the things in our own life, you know, and that decreases some of the stress. We all have burdens. We all have things that we're worried about. We all have things that we're carrying in our heart. But it's a way for us to be able to relax. And it's also a way to be able to deal with many sicknesses that come into our life. We've got to have that balance in our life. We really do. You hold on to all that tension, it's going to stay there. You know, Otherwise, we, we can try to balance it out a little bit. And then hook up with positive, healthy people. You know, you, 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 We have to. I, she doesn't say this, but in, in one of my books, I say, you have to make a choice to be a happy person. I mean, happiness is a choice. <laughs> Do you know... I bet you know some people who choose not to be happy. <laughs> Maybe you work with some people who choose not to be happy. Maybe you live with some people who choose not to be happy. Let me make a comment. Don't spend a lot of time with them. Because, because negative thinking clogs the brain. You hang around with negativity, and that's what you're going to swallow. You see, And then you never see that joy. You never see that. Did you ever notice how negative people whine? <laughs> Nothing good ever happens to me. I never get picked for any committee. They whine, you know? You want to say, get off the cross, we need the wood. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> what other questions do you have? Please. <laughs> I bought your book at a, a church sale for a wood. Inside, you have signed it. I don't know how the person will let go of it. But it's Jiggle Your Heart and Tickle oh Your Soul. That's my very first book in 1996 at four. I don't know which one it is. That's not even in print anymore. Oh, uh, what a treasure. <laughs> not even in print anymore. 
Um, and then there was a second one, polish your soul and spruce up your heart, and that's not in print anymore. I only have three in print. One is called Tickle Your Soul, one is God Knows You're Stressed, and the other is Live, Laugh, and Be Blessed. Yeah, yeah. Those are the three. Please, Gloria. Could you please tell some story about helping a woman in childbirth? Just what you read. That was a good story. Help, helping that little kid? Yeah. It was a, it was a child that, uh, some of you may know, that human maternity services across the street from where I work, and they come over very often to help out with things. And uh, I was away doing, I, I lecture a lot around the country, and so I was away, and when I came back, my secretary said, you know, we got this kid, and she's great, she's helping out, and she's, you know, she's doing all kinds of stuff here. She said, she's great, but she doesn't say a word. I said, oh, okay. She said, you might want to talk to her. I said, why? <laughs> well, because she doesn't talk. I said, do you want to? I don't know. I said, no, okay. So I walk in with my first client, I walk past her, and I said, tell me three things you like about yourself. And the kid goes, you know? So I come back out, and I said, tell me one. And she did. Come back out, tell me two. Okay. Tell me three. I gave her the next question, and she sat all day long in our office doing stuff at a table waiting for me to come out, okay? But would only answer with little phrases, all right? That night, I, uh, about 5.30, I checked my mailbox. There was a note from her asking me if I would be her coach. And I have to tell you something. It's not in my world. You know, I, I, don't, I, I don't know what to do in that world of reality. See, so I, I call her up, and I say to her, I'm just touched. I said, I really am, and, and I'd be very happy to help you, but um, can, can you find something we can go to? Can we take a course? Can we read a book, watch a video? I mean, really, you know, kind of thing. There's no answer. I said, please, say something. Yes, no, I don't know yet. I said, come on over tomorrow, and let's see what we can do. So she comes over. I said, did you find out anything? No. I said, do you know anything at all? She said, just say 512131. I said, okay. I, so I said it. Nothing happened. I said, look, you got to find a book. you got to find a, a video I can watch. I, I don't know what to do. I've only watched it on television. It's not my world, you know, kind of thing. Right? Anyway, make a long search, right? She wasn't supposed to have a baby for six weeks. And that was a Thursday, and on Sunday I got a phone call. It was house, right? And I'm thinking, I'm driving to the hospital. I didn't read the video. I didn't read the call. I don't know what you're doing. That kind of thing. I walk in the hospital, and everybody goes, I can't believe she wants you. I said, what do I do? Oh, you'll be fine. I said, well, what do I do? Don't go. Just go. You know, go tell her you're here. We're... So I go, I stick my head in the door, and I say, I'm here. She goes, okay, I'll be right back. And somebody standing there. I said, what do I do? Ah, you'll be fine. Go get changed. Get out of those clothes. I said, okay. So I go get out of the clothes. I meet somebody in the hallway. Could you tell me what do you do? Ah, you're going to be fine. Everybody, I told everybody second. I go back in the room, and the person who's with her says, oh, thank God you're here. She only wants you anyway. And she leaves me. I said, holy oh, Christmas, what am I going to do now? So I looked at the kid. And I said, now, we're going to be fine. Don't worry, we're going to be fine. Okay, I don't know what to do. Huh? So I said, five, one, two, one, three, one. You know what I'm saying, huh? Anyway, finally, we got to the point of bringing her. The doctor says, we better move into another room. We move into another room. And he turns and he says to me, talk to her. Say something to her. Talk. Now, at this point, she's almost got me on top of her. She's holding on to me for dear life, OK? I turned and said, next time you want to fool around, remember this. That's what I want you to do. That's what you got to do. He says, that's not what you're supposed to say. I said, you keep quiet. I asked you what to do. No, you Go ahead and do it. Uh, we had the baby, and I mean we had the baby. <laughs> but, but, also, anyway. but seriously, do you have any other kinds of questions? Or anybody else want to make a comment about the book is read? It's a lovely book, it really is. Then, please, no, you're just moving your hand. <laughs> please, wait a minute. What other famous comedians have you met? What other, who famous comedians have I met? I never think of people being famous. Isn't that awful? Jack Daniels. Oh, Jack Daniels. Well, that's not Jack. Yeah. <laughs> um, I've met some wonderful people who've touched my life. I've spoken with, I've, I do travel around the country, out of the country too, but I've met some wonderful people that I've been on different programs with. You know, uh, one, of, one of the people I will remember, <coughs> although he was one of the best speakers I've ever heard, was Walter Payton. He was uh, oh. Uh, Chicago uh, yeah. Bears, yeah. and he, he was, we both got yelled at because they were introducing us, but we weren't paying any attention, and we were outside talking and having a great time, and they introduced us, and neither one of us came up, because they came up and said, they introduced you already, and he said, we'll be here in a minute, we just got finished the story, and he was, he was great, and we communicated with each other until we got him, but he was, and I had only met him maybe a year before he got, he was, he was a wonderful man, a great speaker. Um, I, I've been privileged to meet a lot of wonderful people, but I, I don't know if I ever think of anybody being famous. I just think of people being who they are, and I, I don't think any of us are famous. I think we just are who we are. Right? Are you speaking and at the humor workshop this year? Yeah, yeah. You are. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, please. 
Is there any way we can get a schedule of places you're scheduled? We're supposed to be talking about this <laughs> book. Um, I know we, we have to come up with another website and, and let people know because we get that request all the time. I don't ever know where I'm going. I read my calendar. No, I live by my calendar, but we, sh we should probably. Do they have that information at the consultation center? I, I work for Council for Lady, which is across the street from there. Oh, across the street? Yeah, across the street from there. At the pastoral center. So are you yeah. telling me there is no source at the <laughs> <laughs> there is no, no source to get a, a copy of where you might be speaking? Uh, in no, that area. We, haven't do that. we haven't done that, you know. I, I read it in the paper sometime where I'm going to. Let me a quick story. I think what's wonderful about humor is that we can always take whatever's happening, grab it, and then hold it in our hearts. And then when sometimes days are a little darker than others, you know, we can still remember that, that we can grab that, huh? The wonderful story about a couple named Harry and Esther. A wonderful, wonderful couple. They really are. They were married in their 20s. And the two of them just enjoyed life terribly. In the first year of their marriage, they went to the state fair, and they enjoyed everything at the state fair. But the thing they enjoyed the most was the airplane display. The plane would go up and down and turn around, twist and turn. He would do all these maneuvers. And at the end of that, <coughs> Harry turned and said, Esther, before I die, do you think I'll be able to get in that plane while it's doing all those things? And it cost $50 to do this. And so she turned, she said, you know, Harry, $50 is $50. You know. Next year they went, again, they did it. Every year they would go. And they would do a lot of things at the state fair, but never once did they miss the airplane display. Go up and down, and twist and turn. And every single time, Harry would turn and say, Esther, before I die, did I be able to get in that plane? Let's do it. And she'd say, Harry, $50. It is $50. They took their children, and then they took their grandchildren, and again, they would do everything there, but then they got to that airplane, just like up and down and twist and turn. Esther, before I die, you think I'm going to be able to get up in that plane? She'd say, Harry, $50 is $50. <laughs> now they're 80s. They're in their 80s, all right? And they're there at the, at the state fair. They have a good time, and finally again, Go over to the airplane, just like one more time, they watch as the plane does all kinds of crazy maneuvers, goes up and down, kiss and turn, real fast. He turns, he says, Esther, before I die, you think I'm going to be able to get in that plane so I can be able to enjoy that and do all those She says, Harry, $50 is $50. As they're talking, though, this pilot walks by, and he overheard the conversation. He says, you two want to get in that plane? She said, and they said, yes. He said, I'll tell you what, I'll make a deal with it. If you two can get in that plane and not say one word, not one word, it's free. But if either one of you say so much as one word, it costs $50. We can do that. We can do that. So they get in the plane. That pilot takes them up. He goes fast. He goes slow. He twists. He turns. He tips them upside down. He does all kinds of crazy things. 20 minutes later, he lands the plane. He turns around. He says, I can't even believe this. He says, you know the truth is, he says, you're the first people that could ever do this. I can't believe you didn't say one word. How did you do that? How did you do that? And he turned, and Harry turned and said, well, I was going to say something when Esther fell out of the plane. <laughs> The truth is, you know, spend, spend time knowing that you can create this book in your own life. You can find the joy and the humor that's right there. Connect with healthy, positive people, and you have till 7 o'clock tonight to get yourself a welcome It's been delightful being here. Thank you for inviting me.